All right. Good evening, everyone. Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractic physician at Gates Brain Health. Tonight, if I can orientate myself better, tonight I'm talking about trauma, specifically childhood trauma linked to depression. And um, I'm going to go through some of the data on this. I'm circling back to depression. I did a series two years ago, I believe. Yeah, two years ago. Uh, and trying to refresh the material, hopefully provide some new insight, maybe some new ideas if you are suffering with depression or if you know someone suffering with depression. Sadly, um, two years into this global issue that we're in, um, <clears throat> depression, according to an article out of the Journal of the American Medical Association, has increased in prevalence three times what it was in 2019 may not be surprising for you, but for clinical depression to increase by threefold is a really, really, really big deal, in my opinion. So um, <clears throat> just recentering on depression, the physiology of that, maybe that will bring up new ideas for discussions with doctors and things of that nature. Okay. I'm going to show myself in the stream again, and we're going to hide that. And good evening to everyone who is joining. Uh, nice to see you. So, <laughs> oh boy, how do I hide all these? Give me one second while I get my video back in line. Okay. So this is the article I'm uh, citing tonight, major, major depressive disorder and trauma out of the Journal of Psychiatric Research. I believe this is fairly new. I think it's a 2022 article or late 2021. Uh, the title of the article is Altered Regional Brain Activity and Functional Connectivity Patterns in Major Depressive Disorder, a Function of Childhood Trauma or Diagnosis. <clears throat> uh, the neurobiology of depression and anxiety really interests me uh, because uh, we see certain hardwired changes in the brain, in my opinion, more so with depression than we do with anxiety, but there are hardwired changes in the brain with anxiety. And that may help individuals suffering with depression to really understand what they're going through in greater detail. And so uh, understanding may spawn ideas, kind of like I'm saying, and uh, one thing that we really know about depression, and I use this from a traumatic brain injury broadcast, but it's a beautiful representation of the hippocampus. Uh, what we know about depression is that the fear center sits right in front of the hippocampus. The hippocampus is the memory area. And in depression, that fear center tends to enlarge, get bigger, and the memory area tends to atrophy or shrink. Are there studies that maybe find uh, differences with that? Yeah, but the totality of the literature and the current consensus is such that the amygdala, which is the fear center, gets bigger. The memory area seems to shrink or parts of it seem to shrink or not connect as well. That whole process uh, leads to higher cortisol. The cortisol can literally, literally lead to withering of connections in the frontal lobes and seems to be a major reason why this memory area uh, contracts. You can think of it that way. So, and I always try to give this preamble just so there's context uh, for this discussion. So uh, what's the standard treatment for depression? It's either psychotherapy and then oftentimes people go into antidepressants. Antidepressants work mm, at least half the time, but about half the time uh, they stop working or they don't work at all, in essence. So that's referred to as treatment-resistant depression, the world's leading cause of disability by the World Health Organization. So we have to look for other reasons why um, someone is still depressed, persistently, possibly. And in doing so, that's the impetus for this article that I'm showing. Um, ba -ba -ba. <clears throat> Uh, because they really looked at 
are these hardwired changes in the brain a manifest of, or just a result of the depression? Or maybe is childhood trauma a reason why there may be altered connectivity in the brain? And this was a really, really cool study because to my knowledge, no one has ever really looked at this uh, approach. So I hope that makes sense. If it doesn't, let me know any questions you have. But simply in this study, they're looking to see those who have depression without a history of childhood trauma, is their brain different than those who have a history of childhood trauma and have depression? And when we talk about depression, we're not just feeling, talking about a state of feeling sad for a few days or um, you know just feeling down. Clinical depression, known as major depressive disorder, is in essence someone who's feeling really down consistently for many weeks and they have other symptoms like they've lost pleasure, they may be gaining weight, they may be losing weight, they may be not sleeping, maybe they're sleeping excessively. Uh, lots of times they just have a horrible time getting anything done, finding the motivation, getting off the couch, uh, amongst many other symptoms. So that's kind of clinical depression and it's a very, very serious condition, probably one of the most serious conditions uh, on the planet and it has so little understanding for those who don't suffer with depression. So that's one of the main difficulties in that when a loved one is looking at someone who's depressed, in my experience, they don't get it. They don't get what that person's going through. They don't get the physiology of what's happening in their brain. They don't get that it's not just a simple matter of trying harder or focusing more. Um, so that's been my observation, just my observation. So that's why I'm trying to bring some of this information out. Okay, so behind that, da, 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 da. I'm gonna show this one in the stream. So in this study, they basically looked at functional connectivity, as I mentioned, and they simply, they found that areas of the brain and those who were exposed to childhood trauma, who had depression, activated differently and connected differently than those who had depression without childhood trauma. Childhood trauma, uh, I'll probably do a few videos on this, is so important because it becomes a predictor of many seemingly different conditions later in life. Childhood trauma dramatically increases our likelihood of having irritable bowel syndrome or depression or anxiety or post-traumatic stress disorder. Clearly those would be kind of associated, but even chronic fatigue syndrome. So what happens early in our life, even what happens when we're in utero with our mom, if our mom is stressed out, those have those circumstances have huge implications on the biology of our mother, the biology of ourselves, if we're, you know, of young age, and it can lead to hardwired changes in the brain. One of the more interesting elements of this, uh, and I've talked about other studies and how that childhood trauma leads to that fear center becoming more dominant ultimately resulting in the memory area maybe atrophying more because of high stress hormones chronically. Uh, this study was really cool because they found associations and connectivity, particularly in areas of the brain involved with facial recognition, uh, areas of the brain more seemingly involved with sensory perception. But what they found was that the trauma seemed to trigger persistent traumatic memories involving facial recognition, as well as sensory uh, connections to some of that facial recognition activation, which when you really think of it may not be surprising. Um, you know, if a young individual is encountering a, a parent doing something they're not supposed to do or horrific or traumatic, um, there's going to be facial recognition involved with that and maybe some physical uh, violence as well that may have some implications in the sensory area of the brain. So it was really interesting to see uh, this study because it's it, it shows a hardwired change in our brain. Um, I don't have per se the treatment exactly for this, but this, if someone is experiencing treatment resistant depression, my thought goes to, well, are we really investigating the childhood trauma and are we really investigating this with the psychiatrist and with a psychotherapist who's very experienced in trauma. And there is a discussion out there of how much of psychiatric illness is a result of trauma 
And are many of these disorders really resulting from trauma and are we just putting labels on them? I don't know. Um, you know, that's for more discussion for the psychiatrists and the psychologists, but it is intriguing and maybe how our environment interacts with our biology and then it may result in different phenotypes, meaning different presentations, maybe anxiety, maybe depression, maybe post-traumatic stress disorder, maybe OCD, but it's, it's very intriguing to look at. And this study really shows that for someone who's depressed without childhood trauma, their brain is activating differently than someone who had childhood trauma and has depression. And this article goes on to point out, oh, I hope I put this in here. Yeah, I did. Okay. Show this. Their take home point was that these data indicate that major depressive disorder patients with and without trauma exposure are clinically and neurobiologically distinct. So they're in essence saying that, you know, this group that we're saying has depression are not one group. They're really two groups, a group that has depression without trauma and a group that has depression with trauma. So uh, send me your feedback. I hope this is helpful. I hope this spurs more conversations with your doctors, with your psychotherapists, with uh, psychiatrists, yours or those of loved ones or friends or family. And, um, and yeah, I'll be back uh, later this week, probably with another broadcast on some other health topic. Have a good night, everyone, and I will see you soon.